Good evening. This is Chairwoman Jane Lichter. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Monday, November 20th, 2023. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Ms. Lichter. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being broadcast through the BCPS online live meeting broadcast and on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73 and Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the November 20th agenda. Dr. Rogers, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I'm unaware of any additions or changes to this evening's agenda. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or other officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personal matter that affects one or more specific individuals, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice, and conduct collective bargaining negotiations, or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The summary of the closed session and open session information summary can be found on board docs under this meeting agenda date. Every year the Board of Education publishes the annual comprehensive financial report and each year student artwork is included in the publication. Later this evening the ACFR will present will be presented to the board and we would like to recognize those students whose artwork is included. Each selected student receives a gift card. The following students artwork was selected. Ima Onukwa from Dundalk High School, Jason Brooks grade 12 from Maiden Choice School, Ashley Bulnez Ramos, grade 10, from Kenwood High School. Michael Uju Agu, from Perry Hall High School, grade 11. And Raylan Riviera, grade 12, Patapsco High School. So congratulations to those boys, um, those boys and girls. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Mr. McCall. Good evening. Good evening. Chair Lichter, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. I'd like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, and Central Area Educational Advisory Council. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits E1 through E3? So moved from Pong. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Dominowski. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Ms. Frampong? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Ms. Drummond? Ms. Drummond? Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next item, oh, thank you, Mr. McCall. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Rogers. Good evening, Madam Chair Lichter and members of the board. I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. Director, Multilingual Achievement, Department of Schools. Specialist, Department of Facilities Management and Strategic Planning. Specialist, Department of Special Education. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit F1? So moved, from Paul. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Stolowski. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? 
Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Jalewski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Dr. Rogers. All right, our first appointment for this evening is Sonia Blotner. She's attending this evening, please stand. Being appointed to the position of Director, Multilingual Achievement in the Department of School. Her experiences include foreign language teacher in Anne Arundel County Public Schools, ESOL teacher, ESOL instructional specialist, and curriculum supervisor in Montgomery County Public Schools. Congratulations and welcome to Team BCPS. Our next appointment is Christopher Bricado. Christopher Bricado is attending this weekend, not weekend, not yet, <laughs> <laughs> attending this evening with his wife, please stand. Is she here? Okay. Um, he is being appointed to the position of specialist in the Department of Facilities Management and Strategic Planning. With over 26 years of service in Baltimore County Public Schools, his former experiences include lead clerk, Office of Research and Data Analysis, Data Analyst, Office of Student Data, and Planning Analyst, Office of Strategic Planning. Congratulations. And our final appointment is Dr. Susan Phillips. Dr. Susan Phillips is attending this evening with her fiance, Joe Maggio, and is being appointed to the position of specialist in the Department of Special Education. Dr. Phillips' experiences include special educator in Howard County Public Schools, special educator in Harford County Public Schools, and admission, compliance, and transition specialist at Kennedy Krieger Institute. Congratulations, and welcome to Team BCPS. Congratulations to everyone. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by her staff. If not selected to address the board, members of the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. The Baltimore County Police Department's Homeland Security Unit and Office of School Safety has recommended the following safety and security protocols. Participants should be seated in the room during meetings. Individuals who need to stand should go into the hallway to do so. Participants should not approach the table unless called upon to speak and should not approach the dais. Materials brought to the table are limited to electronic devices, presentation papers, and posters no larger than 11 by 14. Other items should be left in your seats. Documents to be given to the board are to be handed to the staff member who is seated in the front area of the meeting space. Information for other attendees is to be left on the designated table outside in the hall. In the event of an emergency that requires an emergency response, such as a lockout, lockdown or evacuation, staff from the Office of School Safety will direct participants. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. Disparaging or derogatory remarks towards students and staff will not be tolerated. Inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. Persons using language that is threatening or promotes violence against a BCPS employee are subject to legal penalties. Persons who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. Please observe the three minute clock which will let you know when your time is up. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. I will now call on our school system affiliated groups to speak, and our first speaker is Marlena Purcell from the Southwest Area Advisory Council. Good evening. Good evening, all. <sighs> Greetings, board chair, 
vice chair in her absence, Superintendent Rogers, and all on the dais. My name is Marlena Colleton Purcell, chair of the Southwest Education Advisory Council. I'm going to be brief tonight. Of course, there's Thanksgiving approaching, and I'm sure, as you, I have lots to do. Um, the most fascinating part of Thanksgiving is about our rituals um, and how it involves. Each year, we gather in anticipation of something familiar, but keep layering on in anticipation for something new or activities. Um, rituals are grounded in the present, they look for the future, and they're rooted in, traditionals ac in traditions across generations. At this time, Baltimore County Public Schools is about one third through the year. And I believe they should be thinking about how can we invite others to join in. A quote from my Southern grandmother says, there's always room at the table for one more. Please keep inviting community stakeholders and partners to the table. We're not asking for much when we sit down. We are hmm, not picky eaters. Our palates can adjust. We have manners, most of us. And most importantly, you need the partners and parents such as the community to tell it like it is. We will tell you when your macaroni and cheese does not have enough cheese. We will tell you when your rice is too sticky and the beef was too tough. In conclusion, we're incredibly grateful to the teachers, the staff, the administrators, the support staff, the PPW, the nurses, um, the, I'm forgetting someone else, all the essential employees of Baltimore County Public Schools are volunteers. That's who I forgot. We know that we can't do any of this as community without you all. So we're grateful and we're thankful. Board members, please remember that our community and our stakeholders are part of a partnership that you all um, can invite us to at any time. Thank you and have a wonderful week ahead. Thank you. Next are our unions, and our first speaker is Cindy Sexton, speaking on behalf of TAPCO. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Lecter, Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Just want to say that TAPCO is here in force tonight to share the message that we need to finish strong in our negotiations. But first, the groundbreaking ceremony for the new Deer Park Elementary School was an exciting time today. It is important for us to celebrate the good that is happening in our school system, and construction of new schools is always exciting. I'm especially happy to hear that it will be a net zero school, which will help our environment as we teach our students. I can't wait to see it and more net zero schools. Yeah. Educators, thank you for all you do. We know the job is hard and the work never stops. But because we love our students and our profession, we keep going back doing what we can every single day to help our students. As we near the end of our negotiations, I want to thank our core and expanded bargaining teams for their tireless work. They are the ones who have been in for hours at a time, making sure that the contract meets our needs and gives us what we need to take care of our students, certainly, but also to take care of ourselves. Because if we don't take care of us, we can't be there for our students. Our team has gotten increased leave time, language to address workload, collaborative planning, increased compensation, and more. And discipline, the topic we probably hear about the most, we have strong language to protect our educators as we support our students. But it will take all of us, educators, support staff, administrators, central office leadership, the community, to address the concerns and find authentic ways to problem solve. But we aren't done. Dr. Rogers, board members, let's finish strong. We only have one more session to wrap things up. Let's make sure that every decision made, every agreement reached, has a lens of what our students need, an educator in the classroom and at work sites. We already have over 100 resignations this year, and more than 10% of them are special educators. Let's do all we can to keep our educators. Our students deserve that. 
And since it is the week of Thanksgiving, of course, I want to thank our educators and support staff, everyone in the school system and school communities who work so hard every day for our students. Thank you for all you do and to those who celebrate, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Next are individual citizens and student groups. And our first speaker is Kenneth Benjis. I believe he is virtual. Mr. Benjis. No? He's, he's There's a sound. Do you want me to go to the next one and then come back? Our next speaker, it, oops, hello? Hello? Oh, no. Is it working? Yes. yes. There, you are. there you are. OK, great. Uh, good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Superintendent Rogers, and members of the board. Thank you for your time. I'm Ken Benjis, a social studies teacher. I'm here tonight that you ask, I ask that you support a fair contract that supports teachers and empowers our students to be their best selves. Uh, that includes eliminating this, the distinction between family and personal sick leave. Many of our educators have children themselves, and we all know that children get sick frequently in school. We need a contract that gives educators the ability to support their family in times of sickness and in health without fear of reprisal. Currently, if teachers need to take sick leave to support their sick family members, they're subject to meetings with administrators, uh, what are they supposed to do? Tell their kids not to get sick? A uh, fair contract that respects our educators and their ability to take care of their family would be greatly beneficial to them and their, and their children. Uh, we need a contract that establishes comprehensive and cohesive discipline practices across the county, including policies that are consistently followed for documentation. It's something we need in our contract to retain educators. A uh, fair contract includes language that protects our nurses and their ability to have a duty-free lunch. We all know that when we get hangry, a portmanteau of hungry and angry, we make mistakes and act in a rash manner. Ensuring that our nurses are able to eat a meal in peace will benefit our students as well. I want to express my gratitude to the board for trusting our library media specialists to select books that are appropriate and beneficial to our students. They're experts in their field and have a wealth of training and knowledge on those topics. Thank you, board, for everything that you do, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, apparently I'm the problem. OK, we're good. Um, next speaker is Lloyd Allen. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Superintendent Rogers, and members of the board, thank you for your time. I'm Lloyd Allen, he, him, special educator in mathematics, speaking as an individual. Defined in 2015's ESSA, specialized instructional support personnel, or CISPs, are not teachers of record, but they are still certified professionals who are necessary to the workings of the school. You have heard me speak on NASP's recommendations for the ratios of student to counselor, school social worker, and school psychologist. BCPS has made progress towards those ratios, and I eagerly await the operating budget proposal to see whether our progress will continue. Thank you, CISPs who support students' mental health. I appreciate the work that BCPS school library and media specialists are putting into making our schools safe, supportive environments. I like that our children have welcoming spaces that foster the love of reading, and I like that all children can find their experiences reflected in a diverse and inclusive collection. I think it's so important that our children can find stories about people with a variety of life experiences so they have the opportunity to grow into more empathetic people. 
I also think it's important that they encounter ideas outside of what any individual adult or peer can teach them. So they have the opportunity to think about situations that might arise in their future before they encounter them. The selection policies our district implements allow each LMS to personalize the collection to their individual communities. And I am glad the board trusts these certificated and credentialed individuals to make choices that support curriculum, curiosity, and leisurely reading. Thank you, media specialists. School nurses are essential for the physical safety of students and staff. They have been pulled in a thousand directions even before three years ago. I note with interest that new language about health suite coverage was included in the agreement signed between BCPS and TABCO this past year, and hope that this language has been implemented universally. Each school nurse that I have worked with has been flexible beyond the bounds of reasonability, and it is important that we respect their humanity and professionalism without taking advantage of them. Thank you, school nurses. As a special educator, successful completion of my duties relies on the existence and support of qualified related services personnel, such as speech language pathologists, occupational therapists, physical therapists, art therapists, music therapists, and others. The impacts that they have on students in providing skills that are not just needed for academic success, but that will be needed out in the world cannot be emphasized enough. Thank you, related service providers. Thank you, Certified Specialized Instructional Support Personnel, also called CISPs. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Erica Ma. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Erica Ma, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here tonight to speak to you as a parent, a teacher, and a TABCO member. I'm also hopeful that what I will say will encourage you to find better ways to support our staff in the upcoming contract negotiations. I'm grateful for the increased ESOL staffing that helped me have a manageable caseload this year, and I'm hopeful that we can continue to strive to meet the needs of all of our multilingual students. I'm grateful to the SLP who brought my daughter's speech issues to my attention when she was younger, and I hope that others whose children need speech are able to access those resources in person. I'm grateful to teacher friends who reach out when they are struggling through a bad day, and I hope they will not resign despite feeling stressed and overwhelmed. I'm grateful to the special educator who stayed after school to answer my questions about a student's IEP. I'm hopeful that we can hire and retain more certified special educators so they can truly meet the needs of their students. I'm grateful to the conditional teacher who has taken, who's taking coursework in the evening in addition to planning and grading. I'm hopeful that she will be successful in her dream to become a fully certified teacher. I'm grateful for our nurse who made repeated phone calls to dental resources to get a student much needed dental care. And I'm hopeful that she can continue to have a health aid when servicing over 600 students. I'm grateful to our long-term sub who knows and loves every student in our school. And I'm hopeful that we can continue to pay her as a long-term or building sub as a small way to acknowledge her value to our school. I'm grateful to the school psychologist who embraced getting covered in stickers as part of a testing um, session. And I hope our school will someday again have an in-person school psychologist assigned to us. I'm grateful to the school counselor who answered my questions about my daughter's schedule even in the summer. I'm hopeful that all schools will be staffed to have a reasonable student to counselor ratio. I'm grateful to all the high school teachers who are taking time out of their evenings, weekends, and probably this vacation coming up to write college recommendations for seniors. I'm hopeful that the teachers of this year's juniors will remain at their high schools so that students can easily contact them for next year's recommendations. I'm grateful for the social worker who responded to my text this weekend about a family who did not receive their Thanksgiving basket. And I'm hopeful that others who need community support are able to receive it from our overworked social workers. I'm grateful to the SLP who took a phone call during her summer vacation trip and came to support our school even though she had retired. And I'm hopeful that she's now truly enjoying her retirement. I'm grateful for BCPS for being transparent while working with TAPCO in our negotiations this year. I'm hopeful that we can reach agreements that will focus on the recruitment, retention of high quality staff so that we may all strive for our students' achievement and well-being. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Helene Groves. Good evening. Good evening. 
Good evening, Chair Lichter and the rest of the board and Superintendent Rogers. It's nice to see you again. Uh, my name is Helen Groves. I'm an early childhood special educator. I'd like to thank you all for allowing me to speak tonight. I echo the sentiments that many of my colleagues have shared about the hard work of teachers and the entire school community, yourselves included. Uh, colleagues have also shared that there are many items unrelated to finances that are driving educators from the professions. You heard from President Sexton about the number of resignations, in, including many special educators, unfortunately. Um, it is incredibly important for BCPS and TABCO to, con TABCO to continue to work together to address ways to recruit and retain educators through our negotiations and contract. One aspect that comes to mind is the EAMP, or the Employee Absence Monitoring Program. The master agreement allows TABCO employees to accrue earned sick time while working for BCPS. This is not time that's given freely. This is time that is earned through our hard work for our students. You heard the testimony from Erica Ma on all of the hard work that occurs before and after um, school for our students. That's unpaid time, but it is time that is definitely valued by the students. Um, EAMP can be detrimental to employees who have no history of using sick time or abusing it when they are still issued disciplinary action, and that can remain in their personnel file. Uh, this definitely impacts morale. I would ask that BCPS continue to work with TABCO on finding a way to structure or restructure the EAMP program to make it more effective and feel less punitive. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. And our last speaker from Individual Citizens is Anna Weisberg, who I think is also virtual. Um, good evening. Can I get a mic check? Yes, you're good. Thank you. Um, good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and Superintendent Rogers. Um, let me see if I can get rid of that echo. Sorry. Um, I'm Anna Weisberg. I'm a teacher of third graders at Villa Cresta Elementary School. Thank you for your service to our students, staff, and community. Board, we appreciate the progress made through the contract negotiations process. More must be done, as you must surely know. In contradiction to the perplexing past precedent of, allo precedent of allocating money for a budget before agreeing to what needs to be funded, we must come to an agreement on our contract before the budget is made. It saddens me that we are here today um, needing to advocate for the basic needs of our students and educators. TAPCO rank and file members did the work. The diverse representative team met repeatedly, volunteering their time outside of the workday to identify the contractual essentials needed to make BCPS's contract more successful at attracting and retaining educators, to make BCPS more successful at meeting the fundamental needs of our district's children. The requests made by our contract team are not frivolous nor asked for lightly. The question of whether or not to improve workload, including pay for coverage and after school duties, and whether or not to address the needs of our SISPSs, our specialized instructional support personnel, our OTs, our PTs, our school counselors, our school nurses, school psychologists, school social workers, speech language pathologists, and other professional licensed personnel, these questions are essential. And the answer must be yes. Yes, we will do all we can to decrease workload. We will pay coverage and after school duties. We will address the thoughtfully considered needs of our SISPSs because we want and we know we need to provide what our students need. We know that we have a school of 1,500 students right now with, I believe, like one or no social workers. Um, we and people leaving, right? These types of professionals leaving after just, um, you know, just one quarter because the jobs are so untenable at the moment. Please give um, a, what, what our educators need to be able to meet the needs of our students and still be able to stay um, okay in the jobs. I respectfully implore you to act with alacrity to address the remaining requests of our negotiations team so that we can attract and maintain a world-class teaching force for our students. Again, thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you.
Next on the agenda was comments for board policies, but there was no um, one signed up. So we're going to move on to action taken in closed session. And for that, I call on Mr. Muser. Good evening. Good evening. Earlier tonight, the board met in closed session and took action on two cases. SD 2023-2024-01 and SD 2023-2024-02. Now would be an appropriate time to confirm the actions taken on those two items. May I have a motion to affirm the action taken during closed session on hearing examiner cases SD 2023-2024-01 and 2023-2024-02 and authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Pumphrey. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Delusky? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pomfrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Abstain. And Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Muser. Next item on the agenda is new business, report on board policies. This is the first reader for these policies, and for that I call on Ms. Christina Pomfrey, Chair of the Policy Review Committee. Thank you. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation of proposed changes to the following board policies. Board Policy 3150, Board Insurance Program. Board Policy 3310, Food and Nutrition Services. Board Policy 3330, Food Service Finance. And Board Policy 5150, Resident and Non-Resident Student Eligibility. These policies are presented to you on tonight's agenda as exhibits I-1 through I-4. May I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee for Board Policies 3150, 3310, 3330, and 5150? So moved from Pong. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Yes, Ms. Um, Booker-Dwyer. Could we pull um, 3310? Yes. So we are, um, is there any? Further discussion. So with full with that one, um, that's on food and nutrition, and I, I think that there needs to be something in that policy around the quality of the meals that we're providing to students, and around data that should be collected so that we can ascertain um, how our students, who are the primary clients for this, um, are perceiving their their daily lunch and breakfast items. Ms. Booker, I'm just going to pause you for one sec so we can vote on the three and then oh, come back for discussion on that one. I didn't, okay. So um, may we have a roll call vote on, which one did you pull out? Three, three, ten. Three, okay, three, ten. so 3150, 3330, and 5150. Ms. Tomanowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're back to 3310, and um, Ms. Booker Dwyer, I'll let you finish your comment. Yeah, so it's just ultimately to put something in there around the quality of the food that we're serving and the data that we collect to not only ensure that um, the students are enjoying it, but also um, the waste that, you know, if we, that's an indicator of whether or not people are eating it or taking it. Um, and so just a quality metric in that uh, proposal and that in 3310. Any other discussion or questions about 3310? You want to respond? Yes, Dr. Rogers. Thank you, Ms. Booker Dwyer. Um, I t certainly hear and appreciate the feedback around um, whether or not students are. Um, liking the quality of food. Um, my question would be whether or not uh, for both uh, attorneys as well as uh, Ms. Pumphrey, that is something, you know, in terms of gathering uh, feedback from students, since that's something that's already in progress by our director, that's something that belongs more in the rule as opposed to policy. 
and I see three nots affirmative. <laughs> okay. That. So you're saying yes, it should be part of the rule, not a change in policy. Yes. So from a legal standpoint, would that be acceptable? That, that would be fine. As long as there's something somewhere where we can start to get at the quality of the food that we're serving. Thank you. So may I have a roll call? Any further, Ms. Well, Domineski? I just, I, I just want to clarify, because you said something about getting um, student um, you know, feedback. Feedback, and I, I'm more concerned. I'm concerned about that, but also, are we getting um, nutritional contents? And yes, oh. we were we're legally required to make sure that we have the right portion size and everything uh, follow those nutritional guidelines, okay. and their regular, uh, you know, uh, inspections and things of that nature. Okay, so n nutritional and quality and quality controls, mm -hmm. as far as like. Ex you know, well, the USDA, days. right? Yes, with USDA. Yes. Okay. Yes. Further questions or Ms. Stileski? Thank you. Just a quick comment. Um, I know in elementary school students, when the students pack their lunches, they throw away what they don't eat. And I wonder if there was a way to just communicate to principals to then communicate to staff that especially with the elementary school students, that whatever they don't eat that they've packed, that they should actually just take home, like in the containers or the Ziplocs, to give parents feedback on what their child might be eating or not eating. I can certainly bring that, uh, share that with our Director of Food and Nutrition Service. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments on 3310? So may we have a roll call vote on the approval of board policy 3310. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frampong? Yes. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Ms. Ham? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Motion passes. The next item on the agenda is new business, consideration of the supplemental appropriation of the FY 2024 budget. And for that, I call on Mr. Hartlove. Good evening, Chair Lecturer. Good evening. Um, board members. Um, I'll just uh, read through the, some highlights of the uh, of the appropriation. Uh, this is a supplemental appropriation. We don't typically do this this time of year. Um, it's a, an appropriation of fund balance that is being requested to um, provide funding which uh, aligns with and supports the July 11th, 2023 board approved contract for an ERP system, an enterprise resource planning system. System includes all general ledger, budgeting, payroll, purchasing, inventory, and, a and human resources processes, which there'll be a report on uh, later tonight. The breakdown of the, of the cost um, is, is shown, shown in the um, uh, supplemental appropriation. Um, the big thing to uh, to note here is is that most of these costs, 13.7, are one-time costs to get the system up and running. Um, this also uh, includes a subscription cost for five years. Uh, once we are able to uh, fully implement the system, we can then um, stop paying for the legacy, the current system, and the ongoing cost will ultimately be um, a wash from what we're paying for our current system. Once we switch over to the new system, it'll be approximately the same amount of, of, of money. But these costs are, are, for the most part, the one-time cost to get the system up and running and the transition cost while we have both systems operating at the same time. Thank you. Are there questions for Mr. Hartlove? Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, Mr. Hartlove. Good evening. Um, you answered the beginning of my question. I'm curious as to the five-year costs um, that we will incur for this system and the use of the annual supplemental appropriation to cover those costs. Are these costs we are incurring this year? Or are those costs spread out over the next five years? They're, they're spread out, but we wanted, because we have to keep our existing system running, we have the budget that we have in our operating budget is going towards that current system. And uh, we wanted to have the, uh, another funding source for uh, during the transition. So that's what this represents is utilization of fund balance during the transition. Okay. So 
In other words, what you're saying is the 24.6 million being requested from fund balance this year will go towards both the new and the current system to keep it'll, them up and running. It'll go towards the current, the, I'm sorry, it'll go towards the new system while the current system is still operating, being paid for out of operating dollars. And then as soon as we have the full implementation, we will no longer play, pay our existing, uh, uh, for our existing system, and then the the uh, new system will be paid for out of the operating budget at that point in time. So whether it's for the new or old system, we are incurring 24.6 million in costs yes. this fiscal year, and that's what we need to approve the supplemental appropriation to cover for our systems. For, needs. Yes, for 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 the for what we are considering the length of the co of the uh, project, the implementation of the project. Okay, that's where I think there's a bit of a disconnect. If you could explain the accounting, because I understand it's a multi-year project, that we would incur those costs as we implement these various products. Right. So, if I'm understanding correctly, the 13 million that would be understandable as one-time costs upfront to get us started. Correct. Where I'm not. Um, understanding is the need for the additional 11 million now when one we're facing a 30 million dollar shortfall next year um, to which we could use fund balance towards and why we need to use this for this purpose in year one versus um, budgeting for the next four years good question and we're not going to be we're, we're appropriating it so it's available but that doesn't necessarily mean we'll need to use utilize all of it so um, so so we have the breakdown of the 24.6 is 13.6 for for one-time items those items will take uh, will, will, will be costed out over a couple of years if our implementation is what we're we're, we're hoping for is a two-year implementation mm -hmm. during that implementation period we'll also ha we'll have the existing system that we're paying for we have operating budget for that and then each year annually we'll have to pay for the the new co the cost of the new system at the same time so it's an extra cost during that time mm -hmm. our goal is to have the system in in two years in which case we we won't utilize all these dollars, but we're we're putting it forward just as a hopefully a worst uh, worst case uh, scenario of what we would need in total to make sure we're putting those dollars aside. But they will not all be spent up front. They will be spent over the course of the implementation. So we're essentially earmarking this right. portion of our current fund balance for our anticipated needs. Correct. Thank you. Correct. That's all I had, Madam Chair. Did you want to say anything about that? Okay, Ms. Demonowski. Uh, I just had like a, an administrative question. Why are we not seeing the presentation before vote before this? Uh, well, the, I don't think the, I think they weren't they weren't all tied. So I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Demonowski, great question. Uh, they're not tied. This this is the um, budget appropriation transfer for the contract that you already approved. It just so happens on the schedule. We're going to give you an update on where we are with implementation. Make sure everyone uh, learns a little bit more about what they can expect to see in the rollout. Only reason I said that it might feel better hearing how things are going before we are like voting to give you another 24 million to appropriate. I know right. we're not going to spend it, right. but yeah, and no, then no, it's fine. I, I, I understand it, it, it's not connected, but it's uh, the ERP. It's not the same as the, in the presentation. It, it's, it's coming. You mean the presentation the coming presentation up? The presentation coming. It's not the same one that they're, we're earmarking money for, to, for the implementation or yes, for, for the same contract that you approved a few right. vehicles. Okay. Yes, Ms. Dominowski, just to, just to ver verify, yeah, we didn't already do the 24, the, we, we did the contract for the 24 million, now we're making sure we have the funding in place to pay for that same contract. So we've approved the contract, now we're putting the funding in place so we can, so we can pay our bills. Correct, it, but it is what we're going to get a presentation on, was what you said, that's all it's, I'm saying. It's the progress it's of the progress project. It's the progress of what yes. we are, Right. we've, we've already approved it, but it's, we're asking, we're getting more money, but it's the same. Correct, well, and, we, and, and, and we did right. kick not off. more. It's not any additional dollars. It's, and it's where the money's coming from. It's just where the money's coming from, and we've already begun the project. I mean, the project has started. It's not more? If the present appropriation is 63 and the supplemental is 24. It, 63 so, to 63 is... The, 
where it says present appropriation. I don't understand. Oh, that's our pre that's our uh, that's our present use of fund balance. Um, in the budget at this okay. point, that has nothing to do with this project. Okay, that makes yes. not. No, I understand. Yeah. Okay. Other questions, Miss Frumpong. Good evening, Mr. Hartlove. Good evening. Um, so, my question: um, One of the things you were saying is that we are going to be using the twenty-four point six for the new system, while the existing system is being paid for. So, the twenty-four billion is not additional money; it's what's already been approved. Correct. It's not, no, it's just backing up the contract that was already approved. So it's not in addition to, it's the dollars that we're using, yes. Thank you. And then the, how much are we currently paying then for the existing system? The existing, these are definitely round numbers, but about, if you can see, you can see here, this is a five year subscription, about 10 million. So it's about 2 million a year, which is coincidentally about what our current system costs as well. About $2 million a year in an annual, uh, 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 um, uh, fee, okay. subscription fee. Okay, so if the project goes as planned, perfect sunshiny day, yes, et cetera. which it will. Right. <laughs> <laughs> then um, we are looking at four million only yes. to be spent out of Correct. that 10 million. Correct. Gotcha, okay, Correct. thank you. Other questions? Okay, thank you, Mr. Hartlove. Oh, wait a second. Don't go anywhere. May I have a motion to approve the supplemental appropriation of the FY 2024 budget? So moved, Stolesky. Thank you. May I have a, do I have a second? Second, so boy. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Ms. Han? No. Uh, Ms. Pumphrey? <laughs> yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. So motion passes. Thank you. You're welcome. The next item on the agenda is the report on the FY 2023 Annual Comprehensive Financial Report. And for that, I call Mr. Hartlove. Sure, and uh, we actually went through the report at the most recent audit committee meeting. Um, so uh, the uh, had good questions. We had uh, uh, the principal from, um, they use the term principal, it's a different type of principal, from Clifton Larson Allen. Uh, and uh, she answered questions as well as, as my staff was there. So um, I think we had a, you know, we had a good good uh, discussion. It is, I want to use the proper term, it's in effect a clean audit. It, it, it's an uh, audit without um, utilizing the uh, terminology that they use, but um, it's a, in effect a clean, a clean audit. Okay. Are there any further questions on the annual comprehensive financial report? Ms. Booker Dwyer? I, yep, I just, I have a question just regarding how it's presented um, because I'm just thinking about the transparency for the public. And, you know, when we get a 125 page report, it can be a bit much for the general public to digest. So is, in the future, it would be great to have this um, broken out into bite-sized pieces or to have a clear presentation that gives the highlights um, just for the sake of transparency and, and so that everyone can understand um, without necessarily having to go through the 125 page report. Right. Right. Unfortunately, there is a lot of this that's mandatory mm -hmm. uh, uh, in order to, to um, uh, it's required by the audit. So um, there are there are sections that I would believe, you know, that I believe are more important and uh, things that, you know, if I were paging people through that I would go to certain highlights. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe there's a way we can do that where we can say, you know, here's the audit for those of you who are you know, CPAs and want to go through it. Uh, but for uh, a person who just wants to know where we stand financially and wants to kind of the highlights, here's something for you that you could kind of page through and, uh, you know, the highlights basically of, of the audit. Yep, that would be helpful. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. The next item on the agenda is the report on academic achievement 
Blueprint Pillar 3, College and Career Readiness. And for that, I call on Dr. DiDonato, Ms. Shea. Okay. Ms. Shea and Dr. DiDonato. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I think, Dr. Rogers, are you starting this? One? I will. Once we have the PowerPoint up, please. Thank you. Next slide. Good evening. We are very pleased to present a report on college and career readiness. Um, college and career readiness, for making sure that we're all on the same page, really means that a student is prepared after 12th grade to go directly to work or enroll in a post-secondary program and succeed without the need for remediation. Um, there are several components that make up college and career readiness. You see them on your slide uh, where academic and content knowledge is the majority of the focus in class in classes and in schools but we also work uh, with our partners inside and out of school to provide our students with access uh, to a variety of skills and strategies including um, higher order thinking skills social and emotional intelligence intelligences as well as employability and life skills um, College and career readiness is very important uh, because it is known to uh, increase the level of success for students after they leave our school system and reduce gaps uh, in access for students. Uh, main components include rigorous academic courses, career and technical education, and college and career counseling. And so for the remainder of this presentation, Dr. DiDonato and Ms. Shea will take us through the specifics of Pillar 3 and how we we have prepared at Baltimore County Public Schools and what our next steps are. Thank you, Dr. Dean Love. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Next slide. On your screen, you'll see um, the four core tenants of Pillar 3 for college and career readiness. And what Pillar 3 sets to do is establish new standards for college and career readiness to ensure, again, as Dr. Rogers had said, that students are prepared uh, for college and career beyond BCPS. It sets a goal for students to see to achieve certain outcomes, um, college and career readiness standards by the end of 10th grade. It also develops a support pathway for students who are not meeting those expectations by grade 10, and we'll talk a little bit more about what those are that are in place in BCPS. And what it also does is create multiple pathways for students who are meeting college and career readiness standards to experience um, college and career experiences at zero cost to the students. So that could be through uh, dual enrollment, it could be through a print it could be through internships. So lots of different opportunities for students. Next slide. When we look at uh, this slide, this really describes the responsibilities of the school system in helping students meet college and career readiness. So we're gonna start at the bottom looking at the blue box. So from the very beginning, training for teachers in pre-kindergarten through three in the science of reading. So ensuring that our teachers are well prepared to teach our students those foundational skills that are gonna lead to their success um, as early as pre-kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. Um, the orange box, high quality instructional materials, we've come forward before you several times looking at um, enhancing our curricular materials to ensure that they're aligned with the rigor of the standards, that they're evidence-based, and this is really one of those um, tenants of Pillar 3, so ensuring that the school system has that in place. Having a comprehensive literacy and mathematics plan, that's part of what we submitted as our plan um, to MSDE when we submitted uh, Baltimore County's blueprint plan, implementation plan. Providing targeted supplemental instruction, evidence-based interventions. Again, you heard us come to you at the start of the school year talking about our reading interventions and supports that we really needed for our students um, in middle and high school to ensure that they were meeting those targets moving forward. Um, and consistent content-rich instruction in science and social studies. When you look at the Maryland report card, at, for schools, it really is looking at students having a well-rounded, balanced curricular experience, which includes all content areas. So while we focus on reading and math, those are foundational so that students can truly access those other content areas. Next slide. 
This slide depicts the new college and career readiness standards for you. So again, as we had just spoken, uh, by grade 10, the goal is for all students to meet CCR standards. And what that means is that students have received um, a three or four on the um, MCAP assessment for English, a three or four on the MCAP assessment for math, or they've scored a 520 on the math SATs. Sorry, was just distracted by whatever was talking behind me. Um, and what we want students to do is, again, meeting those standards by grade 10. Um, those current measures are all standardized assessment measures. MSD is currently exploring, and I believe they will vote on their uh, oh, December board meeting, uh, to look at some additional measures beyond just standardized assessments. So they're looking at possibly incorporating um, a grade point average as well as certain grades in certain courses. Uh, right now they're specifically looking at a student achieving um, an A, B, or C in one of the three math courses, Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2. Geometry may be in or out, depending on what they decide, um, as well as having a cumulative GPA of 3.0. Um, so that is part of what MSD is looking so that there's additional pathways for students to be identified as college and career ready. Right now there's just standardized assessment measures. Next slide. Our goal is to keep students on track in order to meet this. Again, once students have met these expectations, there's lots of different opportunities that BCPS is able to facilitate and provide for them. So part of keeping students on track is really looking at um, those priority core instructional areas of reading and math um, in grade 10. And what we find is that you know students who are performing well in their coursework, who are uh, having a high GPA, achieving um, in reading and math. They're well prepared for the SATs as well as well prepared for the MCAP assessment so that they can score those three and fours that we would like for them to achieve. For students who are in grades 11 and 12 who've met these expectations, they can enroll in AP courses, IB courses, if it's at one of our IB high schools, dual enrollment courses, early college courses, um, and really work towards um, CTE credentials as well as apprenticeships. We currently offer these pathways for students who have not met college and career readiness standards, hoping that that exposure is really going to help motivate some of our students. Um, however, the blueprint only requires that we provide this for students who have met college and career readiness standards. For students who have not met that, so the student who had, did not achieve a three or four on the English 10 um, MCAP or who did not get a 520 on the math SATs, um, we're required to provide an individual plan for them so that we're looking at instruction that can supplement uh, those key areas for them to help them meet those standards. There's currently not a secondary assessment measure for them. So they still may be identified as not meeting college and career readiness standards, but we are providing that supplemental support and instruction in order to help develop those skills um, to prepare them for college and beyond. Next slide. One of the components of Pillar 3, it identifies that LEA create and implement a ninth grade tracker system, and that's the uh, language from the blueprint, to measure progress towards on-time graduation. We have to report daily to MSD on that. So we use Power Inform, which is one of our data management systems within BCPS. It provides uh, information to uh, school administrators, district administrators, from everything from student attendance to uh, report card grades, um, map in prior years, um, MCAP all the way through, so that we really can look at a profile of a student. What are they like as a test taker? What do their grades look like in fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade as they're moving forward so that we can identify those students who might be at risk for not meeting college and career readiness standards and try to intervene before they take the 10th grade English assessment and then do not meet the standard. Um, so it's really helping our high school administrators or middle school administrators really analyze where students are um, so that we can again try to intervene with them earlier. Next slide. This again is another slide, just a different visual taking uh, the language from the blueprint. Again, showing the different opportunities that students can have, give you a little bit more detail about what incorporate uh, is encompassing within a comprehensive early entry college preparatory program. So again, that's looking at our IB programs. Um, 
our advanced placement courses, you can see again the early college enrollment, so students um, may be able to graduate from a BCPS high school while also earning an associate's degree, um, or which is halfway through a bachelor's degree. So again, at zero expense to families, um, students can be leaving BCPS with a high school degree and associate's degree and well on their way uh, to earning a four-year uh, degree with only two more years of college left. Um, again, providing those opportunities for career and technical education programs, uh, looking at certificated licensure programs. You've heard many uh, pieces of information as far as some of our various magnet courses and uh, CT courses where students can um, earn credentials in HVAC, they can learn uh, credentials with cosmetology, so really looking at those uh, career and technical pathways for students, um, as well as providing students with youth apprenticeship opportunities that's both within BCPS and outside of BCPS. Currently, BCPS employs many of our students as youth apprentice apprentices, which is a great opportunity for us to internally work to build our own workforce by providing students with those opportunities, either working in our Office of DOIT, I understand we have uh, an apprentice in our Office of Science also, so giving students those opportunities to be paid, um, earning credits, working for BCPS to really build our own workforce at the same time as providing kids with some really amazing opportunities. Next slide. We did mention um, those support plans that we do need to put in place for students who are not meeting college and career readiness standards. We really worked collaboratively um, both through the Office of Curriculum Instruction with the Department of Schools in order to develop um, some really robust plans uh, to provide students with access and opportunities to fill in those gaps and develop those skills that uh, they still need to, to work on in order to be prepared for beyond BCPS. Thank you. So <clears throat> the, this part of the pillar is new in terms of identifying what that individualized support plan looks like for a high school student. And uh, <coughs> this is an area of blueprint that um, talks about specifically using problem-based or project-based learning as a part of those career readiness skills. So it isn't just about putting them in a remedial course, it's actually identifying those problem-based or project-based skills that would further prepare them for readiness for both college and career. Um, and so to work on this, content offices have been partnering with each other and also with other LEAs across the state that are trying to uh, move forward with this piece of the plan. What does that actually look like? for a high school junior or senior um, to have these opportunities. So we are, um, have worked together to develop different projects. Um, they're still in the um, draft stages, but we are getting feedback on um, what, and I know we've already talked this evening about what are students going to be interested in? What's going to help them actually invest in developing those college and career ready skills? Um, how does that individual support plan reflect both their needs as a student and why they are not yet CCR? So what area, whether it's in literacy or mathematics? Um, and then how does this problem-based or project-based learning use culturally responsive strategies to help them demonstrate those readiness skills? We also have been partnering with CCBC. We often talk about our partnership for dual enrollment, thinking about things like acceleration or enrichment courses. But CCBC also has courses that they use for students who are not yet ready. Um, and they use these courses sometimes after graduation. Sometimes students who have not yet demonstrate readiness have to enroll in courses before they're able to earn credit. So part of our partnership that's called for under Blueprint is to partner with CCBC about offering these courses earlier so that when we use that on-track um, indicator in grade nine and we see that students are not yet on the path not only for graduation but for CCR we can potentially enroll them in these courses earlier so that they are developing those skills while still in high school next slide please and so um, part of the pathway um, we've talked before about um, the pillar talks about students having this opportunity really that end of that 10th grade year so we used to think about having four years of high school to get students ready Blueprint is really asking us to think about doing that by grade 10 so that students have two years while still in high school to explore career pathways or post-secondary pathways, um, which is really designed to help them explore those opportunities either through dual enrollment or early college access, um, which we do through our ECAP program, the early college access program at Woodlawn, and through our PTEC programs. Um, those are at Dundalk and Owings Mills. These are those partnerships that Dr. DiDonato talked about where students are enrolled in pathways in which they graduate with both 
a high school diploma and that associate's degree. But it also talks about allowing students to engage in those CTE apprenticeship opportunities where they earn an industry recognized credential. So they are certified to go right into the workforce at the time of graduation and sometimes before. Um, this is also important because Blueprint wants us to help students not see it as a binary. Students, it's college and career readiness. Some of our students go into career pathways in order to help support paying for college. We want students to see that they have multiple opportunities and pathways while still in high school so that they can use that time to develop that path of study. <coughs> Next slide. Pillar 3 also talks about not starting in high school. So we want to start the conversation around career counseling er even earlier. And so the pillar talks about ways for us to expose students to career readiness, have them experience different opportunities for career, and then ultimately make those choices around their program of study to hopefully pursue that pathway. So in BCPS, we have worked in our partnership with both the Community College of Baltimore County and the Department of Economic Workforce Development in the county government um, to talk about career counseling one way we've done that is through our partnership with Junior Achievement of Maryland. Through Junior Achievement, we have multiple opportunities at elementary, middle, and high, um, including the opportunity to attend BizTown as a field trip in elementary school. I'm happy to update. Last time we were here, we talked about a two-year rotation and not every school, and we might have a virtual. We've been able to work with Junior Achievement to get enough days that we will be able to do that on a two-year rotation, so that's an exciting update. Um, Finance Park, our seventh graders are going to have an opportunity to experience financial literacy, which is an important part of developing those career skills as well. And then just last week, our eighth grade students had an opportunity to participate in JA Inspire, which is essentially a virtual career fair where they get an opportunity to interact virtually with lots of different career pathways. And there's also associated instruction that happens in their social studies classes where they start thinking. Um, and it's a perfect time to do that because they're thinking about high school and thinking about those next steps. Um, next slide. And so we've, uh, many times, we love to talk about CTE um, in BCPS, but this is another part of our pathway. So Blueprint sets a lofty goal that by the year 2031, 45% of our high school students will have earned an industry-recognized credential or complete the high school level of a registered apprenticeship. So an apprenticeship is different than an internship in that it requires um, an one credit of instruction and then 450 hours of paid time on the job, which is definitely an expansion um, I know you can't see all the data slides there um, linked on that infographic, but that's a part of what we do to help support to onboarding our different business partners that we work with through workforce development and just really emphasizes some of our growth over time. Uh, we went from having nine students in apprenticeship when we first started in 21-22 to over 125 this school year, some of which came through, as Dr. DiDonato described, um, BCPS becoming our own employer to provide those opportunities. Um, but we've also worked to develop um, funding supports through Blueprint to help students with access to transportation um, or certification fees so that that doesn't become a barrier for students. You can see a photo there of a very proud student um, in earning their industry recognized credential there. Next slide. We also wanted to frame how we are in relationship to the state. So this data actually shows the metric as it was captured in the More Jobs for Marylanders Act. So you can see the dial there. Um, this is when it was also including data on completers. So you can see Baltimore County um, has led the state in terms of the number of students we have enrolled in CTE programs. But also with our completer data, um, we were well on our way to that goal of 45%. Currently, as the blueprint talks about, they are just like reimagining the CCR metric. They're thinking about whether a completer status is enough or whether we also have to add this piece around apprenticeship or industry recognized credential. Um, so that's work across the state that is happening about what's the difference and how we set up those opportunities for students. Next slide. This graph illustrates the over 1,100 certifications that we earned last year. Um, you can see on the left-hand side, it's talking about uh, space across schools, but then also across different programs. Uh, we also want to offer that some of this data collection was impacted in some of our transitions in the last several years, and so we now have much more robust infrastructures for reporting and collecting this data. Uh, so we're already on our way to um, improve the certification data. But you can see um, over 1,000 students did earn that CTE certification. 
<clears throat> and then last but not least, um, we just wanted to talk a little bit. You can go to the next slide, sorry. Um, we have over 40 different CTE programs and pathways of study, both through our magnet programs, but also offered in every single one of our comprehensive high schools. There are multiple CTE programs of study. I mentioned already the 1,100 certifications, but that was done at no cost to the student, which is important as well. Um, an area where we have been working to grow, as I mentioned, the shift from the data required in the More Jobs for Marylanders Act versus the industry certification is to actually make sure that every program leads to a certification, which was not always the case. In some cases, those programs were when you finished the course sequence, you met the requirement. So we've been really working to make sure there was an industry certification aligned to each program of study. And so we're happy to report that over 95% of our programs now do offer a technical skill assessment, and at least 90% of them offer that industry recognized credential. And then just to always keep it centered on our students, <clears throat> we wanted to showcase Richard. He is one of our first graduates of our P-TECH cohort. Um, and he graduated from Dundalk High School in June of 22 and went on to continue and was able in just one more year to graduate from CCBC with his associate's degree um, and is currently employed by Johnson Controls, one of those partnerships. So um, with a, a district as big as ours, sometimes it's important just to have a face to, to remember. So we wanted to end with that. Hmm. And with that, we take any of your questions. Thank you for that presentation. Questions or comments from the board? Ms. Hen. Thank you. I um, agree. Thank you for the presentation. It was outstanding. I appreciate it. Um, my question has to do with da data points. Are we tracking the number of our graduates who go on to CCBC and require remedial courses in their first or subsequent years? It's great to see the partnership with CCBC, <coughs> and, I'm, and I know we have um, an agreement in place for data exchange, but is that something we're looking at? Yes. So not only do we collect it, but the state and the national um, organizations collect it and report that. So we do meet with CCBC to identify those patterns. And that is a part of what led to this strategy to <clears throat> offer those remedial courses in ninth and 10th grade when we see students not on a track instead of waiting until after they graduate. To put them in, but beyond BCPS, are we tracking them once, say they continue on to CCBC? And if they require remedial courses once they leave us, is that something we are also tracking? I, it's great that we're placing them early, but are we looking beyond graduation? Yes, that was the data that drove us to propose this recommended solution because we were collecting the data and um, having that articulation about how many of our students required that post-graduation still needed that to fill that gap between meeting the high school diploma requirements and that readiness. And that's what drove us to propose the solution to really strengthen what readiness meant prior to that. Thank you. And my sure. second question, you mentioned that the 10th and 11th um, grade individual plans are new, that, that that's something we're starting to use the tracking system and really be proactive and that, that's great um, because I know too many anecdotally get to 12th grade, get to their prom and say, you can't go to prom because you're not going to graduate. And that's when families are finding out, students may know, but families are finding that out for the first time. Are we using this informed system to communicate those earlier and often, and are we including families with, when we share that information? So one part of the plan development is a meeting with the family um, so that the family is an integral part of that planning process to understand where their students are, measures that the school is going to take to implement to help support them in developing those skills. Additionally, our Office of School Counseling is working um, to implement a, a new uh, college career system um, that will also provide some of those uh, letters on an ongoing basis, communicating with families um, updates about where their students are and how they're performing and progressing towards graduation. So are there given set point, you know, touch points and which ones are we doing now and which ones can we look forward to seeing implemented in the future? Can you d differentiate between those? So with regards to the implementation of the plan, we're going to begin with our 11th graders, and we're implementing it beginning in the spring. So January is when schools will start to work on it. So parents could expect meetings anytime between January, February, or March range for those students who need those plans who are current 11th graders. As far as the school counseling letters, um, that's something that they're working on for implementation next year, I believe. And, and so presently, we review ninth graders when they come in and, and assess their um, CCR. Is that what we're doing now, or, and we're looking to, 
I'm unclear as to the current state versus the future state. Can you speak to okay. that a little bit? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let me back up because um, one thing that's important is graduation is not the same as CCR. Correct. So that's one thing that I just want to separate. So the current metric is measured by the end of 10th grade. So the ninth grade tracker is about being on track for graduation. So that's are they passing the required courses and earning enough credits to articulate. But what it also helps us identify is who's not on track to demonstrate that readiness on the current assessments or with that GPA, which is what's on the table. Currently, what's been practiced since 2013 was there was a, note, a broad notification to families letting them know your student has not yet demonstrated college and career readiness. A lot of the feedback was, but my child got into college. What does that have? It was confusing for families, and I see a lot of you nodding. And so part of what is different, so that's what we have been doing. We've been doing the notification when they hadn't met the target, but there wasn't really um, a significant shift in what happened. So what? What's the difference? The change in blueprint is the so what. So if that student has not yet met the readiness at the end of 10th grade, they have to enter into this individualized support plan. We're starting with their juniors. They will have a meeting with the family this January February, that's the part that's new, where then they will have a differentiated path of support using some of this project paced learning and these touch points to shift that um, metric to say they demonstrated CCR. So that's the part that's new. And, and I guess my point is that the more opportunities we can use to engage families Absolutely. early and often Absolutely. with both CCR and graduation, and I speak to them interchangeably, not that they're the same, right. but Both in terms of family perspective and what we need to be communicating in terms of readiness, whether that's, yes, let's get you graduated first, but we're looking ahead right. at your CCR. We that's wanna exactly make sure right. we check both boxes and yeah, exactly we need right. to do better and make sure that families are first and foremost in terms of communication. And I think Dr. Udinato also mentioned, because you're exactly right, the shift from awareness and notification to actually engaging the family with the co-construction of that plan so that students, too, understand why does it matter, what do I need to do to demonstrate that readiness so that we can help make that connection is a big shift. So rather than just a one-time notification, it's actually engaging in an ongoing partnership about how we create that individualized support plan. Okay, thank you. Sure. Other questions or comments? Ms. Pumphrey? Hi, thank you Hi. for your presentation. Um, just a quick question about the opportunity for reassessment. How does that, when and how does that occur after when students in 11th or 12th grade are recognized as not meeting CCR? Great it, question. Yeah. <laughs> there currently isn't a pathway for reassessment. So currently um, it is the obligation of the school system in LEA to work with the student, to be monitoring their progress, to provide them with those instructional opportunities based on um, both interest as well as the area of need, whether it's ELA or math. Um, but there is not currently a mechanism for reassessment. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions, Mr. Young? I wanted to expand on um, Ms. Hen's question earlier or get clarification. Is CCBC the only institution where we're getting feedback on whether our students are career ready and have to be put into those remedial classes? No. I was going to say, go ahead. <laughs> no, if I could take that one. We have, uh, we have access to data from the National Clearinghouse, and that allows us to see how our students are doing after they leave us. We have data at least up until five years after they leave. It might be up to six years, uh, depending on what you know, school they choose to go to, which is why it's critically important that senior year when the counselors are asking those students to fill out those forms so we can track our students. Uh, to Ms. Hen's point, I did want to come back. Um, even though college and career readiness is not the same thing as graduation, I want to acknowledge that as a school system, uh, some of the work that we're doing is to make sure that we have a consistent plan of implementation for how we inform families that students are not doing well and not making adequate progress towards graduation, which is likely the kind of feedback that you're hearing from constituents. It's about if they can't go to prom. It's about if they can't go to graduation. Right now, the way that college and career readiness is, um, this is information that we share with families, but those kinds of consequences are not the same. They're more the consequences that I shared in the beginning in terms of how it impacts the future of students. And so I want to acknowledge as a school system that we hear that feedback, and it's part of work that we'll take back uh, between the division of schools 
Schools Division of Curriculum Instruction and work with our principals, particularly at high school, to make sure that we're uh, informing parents in a way um, and making sure that they're acknowledging receipt of the messages that we're sending uh, early and often so that no one uh, is, is feeling that they're surprised. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Mm -hmm. Mr. Young. Okay, it's Dr. D. <laughs> we have visitors. Yeah, I, Keep going. Dr. D'Anato, um, when you were talking about the college and career readiness and you know what's available to people to our students in the 11th and 12th grade that we have to make available as far as like AP and IB. I thought I heard you say it, say that for some of the students who aren't ready, we give them a taste of that anyway. Um, okay, so we, so yes, you're nodding your head, yes, so yes. we've done that. Uh, and how's that worked out? Have some <laughs> taken the challenge and progressed forward, whereas others have, were like, okay, we need to reassess what we're doing for them? So currently we have actually more students who are not CC already participating in our CCBC courses um, than students who have met that standard. Um, so clearly students are, uh, we've provided lots of flexibility with regards to the courses they can take. They didn't have to necessarily be credit bearing. So some of those things we try to give a very open, wide range of opportunities for students, especially as we had um, ESSER funding available to help support us doing that. Um, however, the blueprint requires just that the students who've met that standard are provided with that. Thanks. You're welcome. Ms. Boger Dwyer. Okay, so thank you for the presentation. I just have five quick questions for you. <laughs> and I want to start back at the top. So I want to go all the way back to slide two, that slide with um, college and career readiness. So I know that right now, uh, college and career readiness is by MSDE, is, is the, it's a floor, right. right? So it's what you get on your state assessment, it's industry credentials, and potentially GPA and, and course credit. But then when we look at this slide too, and we see all these other components of college and career readiness, how are we measuring that? And how are we communicating to parents that your students have have these employability and life skills, the higher order thinking strategies, that uh, the different in, the social and emotional intelligence? Um, so beyond just academic performance, with is that measure of essentially college readiness um, or an industry credential, which could be a career readiness? What about all these other pieces of the pie? How are we measuring that? I was going to say, can I say one part of it? So yeah, I'm going to start first with how we teach it. And because I think your question about how we measure it, I can't identify a specific assessment that I could say, this is the assessment we use that measures those skills. I'd be interested in one. I think it is an important part of this larger puzzle. So the, the first answer is we don't have a specific assessment. We do, however, have some of these specific skills been built into direct coursework. So we have our CCRD course that many of our high school students take. That is a big focus of that course is developing these types of skills and so the assessments for that course is one way. It's not currently a requirement for every student but that's one avenue. Um, the other piece is we do have some of these pieces built into across the curricular um, areas um, and then the other piece that I will offer is we have um, our six-year planning process that our school counselors engage in. We also have access to something called Tradeify that we use that our um, college counselors and our CTE teachers use together mm -hmm. which really helps measure aptitude, interest, what are some skills that you currently possess? It's not necessarily measuring um, performance, it's more measuring potential, um, which is another tool that I think helps communicate to students and their families what's gonna best suit them and what things they can do now while in high school to strengthen some of those skills. Um, but I do think um, it's an area of growth really across the state about how do we really capture, which I think is a part of this larger conversation about redefining the CCR metric, because some of that research study was, is one assessment that's purely academic enough to really measure all of these skills, to your point, I think is why that conversation is happening. Uh, so I do think it would be good to have something to communicate to parents yeah. beyond just your child got to be in Algebra 1 mm -hmm. um, around the other skill sets that they may have acquired. Uh, and whether it is through taking this course, you know, it's on the report card or just something so that, you know, when those notifications go out to parents that your child is not college and career ready, it's only one piece of the pie, really, that we've measured and not um, all the other components. 
so then my next question was around um, around slide six. So on slide six, where we um, where we talk about once again to keep students on track to meet the college and career readiness. What are these on track measures? So if a student and, and then I get back to, into thinking like, okay, so if a student earns an A in English nine, is that going to correlate to them earning a three or four on the MCAT? Um, so how do we know that students are truly on track for college and career readiness? Is it solely just the grade that they're earning or what, el what else is there? So part of our curriculum-based assessments are measurements of those standards along the way. So students participating in ninth grade English, while they do get an end of course grade and marking period grades, during the course of that class, they are, are taking periodic assessments and measures of certain standards along the way. So really looking at how students are performing on those along the way give us a measure, a pre-measure of what they may perform on when they get to 10th grade MCAP. So we do have small measures along the way to see where they are. Okay. And then with slide 14 on the, it, it had the students participating in um, CTE certifications and you have all the schools in the, um, the count of CTE certification exam results. I thought it was interesting that the comprehensive high schools had more students um, it, it was a higher count there than some of the technical high schools, which, and so could you just talk a little bit to why is that? Because it, it, you would think that, you know, students who are going to, they, we'll use Carver since that's the first one, as opposed to Catonsville High School, um, they're going to Carver to get those industry credentials. So what's happening there, whereas at the comprehensive high school, these students are killing it. They're, you know, they're getting the, their credentials, but then at the schools where we, that's where the focus is, it's not happening all the way. I mean, you see Eastern Tech, that has a high number, but then you go to Owens Mills and it's like, what are they doing there? What are they getting their credentials in? And why is that not, I would just expect to see the technical high schools, I would see those bars high, mm -hmm. and then the comprehensive high schools not as high. So do you know why or the root causes or what's happening there? I can certainly share that what we're looking at, the other data points for the same type of question. So first it comes to um, not every, pro it's really, a <clears throat> excuse me, easier to look at programs. Right. So we see our highest rate at things like Autodesk and some of our programs that have that type of certification mm -hmm. or where the certification can be like the AP computer science exam. We see a high um, participation in Adobe, for example. So it's less about the school and more about the programs where we see the real differential is that there are certain programs that, for example, Carver doesn't have as much because much of Carver is focused on the arts. Right. And so their um, certification and credential is different. So some of what I talked about in terms of making sure that every program results in that is some of what you're seeing play out. Um, and then the other piece is also making sure that our data reporting is strong. So as I mentioned, some of this does reflect um, a lack of, um, I would say, 100% confidence in the reporting because of ransomware and some of the changes we made in the system. So part of our root cause analysis has been to talk to individual teachers to shift our training model and to create that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But I think the first piece, it's easier to align. What we were trying to illustrate is it isn't actually just in a magnet program because I think it's important for students and their families to know that they have this opportunity in every high school. But to your point, then taking another look at what are those programs that are uh, we're seeing the most success in technical skill attainment and how do we then leverage that to the other programs. Yep. And then it would also just be interesting to see how many students actually, how many students took the credential exam and how many students actually passed, passed it. We're, we're looking at the same that, thing. That's a data point that we are interested <laughs> in looking at also too. And then um, my last question is on slide nine. And with slide nine, I was I, I blew up that little piece on the side with the content area, mathematics, and what the student would do. So is this a bridge project? It's oh. different than a bridge project, but it's got a similar vibe. A right? bit, it, it, it felt, it I felt was a little bridge, bridge project, project vibe. Dish. Yes, and actually okay. I used that analogy when we were talking it, with people about it. But it's yeah. here's what's different though which I think is critical in terms of, so, and this is new, we're, we're creating and developing that because this is an area we have not, as an LEA, given, been given mm -hmm. really any guidance. The bridge project was a set project, every kid did it regardless of why they were not yet CCR, what areas they needed, and it had no really responsiveness to the individual student. 
this is going to be students are going to have some choice there's going to be lots of projects the kids are going to be able to have agency around it's going to measure those same skills but that's one really important difference because part of what blueprint is asking us to do is to align it to where is the gap in the students not yet readiness and how does this individualized program so that's an important distinction that i'm hoping will um, change the outcomes to be different thank you sure okay. mr mcmillian uh a couple weeks ago, I attended a program at Kenwood in the afternoon, and they had something. It, they had a chef, and they had kids provide food, and it was called a Pro Start mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Culinary Program. Yes, sir. Now, is that a CTR program? It is a CTE program, yep. And, and how is... So that's separate from the Sollers Culinary Correct. and the... Mm -hmm. and the Yes, that allows us to expand and offer that type of program at a comprehensive high school. So how many, are, are there other pro starts besides just the culinary piece? Are there other pro start programs out there? There sure are. If you give me a second, I can tell you exactly That's where. Because I can't <laughs> my computer. No, I have it. Give me one sec. I will tell you where. And so the what you referenced in Sollers and um, some of our other places, that is baking and pastry or their culinary arts magnet. The Pro Start program talks more about food and nutrition, safe preparation, safe handling of food. So it's a more comprehensive approach. And I'm going to tell you exactly this. Like little. a catering piece. Um, more, how do I cook for my family or myself in a way that's healthy? And how do I earn the serve safe certification so I can work in a restaurant and in a restaurant kitchen and do it safely? So these may not be students who want to pursue a career in hospitality management, but they could. But it's more for um, students understanding um, how to cook for themselves, their family, understanding health, and maybe pursue a job in that industry, but maybe not that career pathway. It is at Catonsville, Kenwood, Lansdowne, Milford Mill, Newtown, Overly, Parkville, Patapsco, Perry Hall, Randallstown, Sparrows Point, Towson, and Woodlawn. Wow, and that's the Pro Start Culinary. Do, yes, do you call it culinary? Is food and beverage management, but we okay. use the Pro Start curriculum. Okay, and then lastly, are they in competition for the Magnet School culinary monies? I mean, are, <laughs> are, are they all in competition for monies to run their program and provide them the supplies and equipment that they need. So to some degree, there is a budget that is allocated differently based on the needs of the program, but we don't have a competition per se. We just use the allocation based on the needs of the program to make sure that schools have what they need. The needs are different. The equipment needs are different. So the allocation may be different, but we don't uh, pose schools to compete against each other. Are they coming from the same pot of money? Everything There's, comes from one. Well, everything comes from <laughs> one, but um, there are CTE funds identified for school as well as magnet funds d identified for school. So there, there's two different like funding pathways. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. And to Mr. McMillian's point, um, Mr. Young and Ms. Pumphrey and I had the pleasure of going to Patapsco last week for a, I'm going to get all the names wrong, but just bear with the apprentice signing. Yes. So there's so many hidden gems throughout our county for mm -hmm. CTE that, um, I guess I was so embedded in elementary, I didn't realize what the grown-up kids were doing. But I mean, I just feel like every time we go somewhere, to Mr. Millian's point, that was catered by these students at Kenwood. When we went to um, Patapsco last week, we saw four um, employers who were beaming more than the kids were as far as their partnership with the school and with giving kids this opportunity. So there are so many of these hidden gems out there um, that just are providing our kids with opportunity after opportunity. I just don't think everybody knows about it. Like we didn't know about it until we sat in that audience and just was thrilled um, you know, with what we were seeing. So I think any way we can help families, help the public, help anybody really understand um, what is offered. Because like I want to know also what Owings Mills, what 160 kids at Owings Mills got a, yeah. I know they have a whole graphic um, 3D printing, all of those pieces. So um, it's, it's, it's one of our gems of programs, our CTE. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for everything that you're doing. Thank so, you for attending everyone and for, for sharing that story for right. our students and families. Ms. Hen? I just had a quick follow-up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and this is back to slide 14 as um, board members are discussing. I, would too, would like to understand what our capacity is and how many students have opportunities within each, maybe within each segment of C the CTE programs, engineering, culinary, health sciences, by school, 
who has the opportunity that could be participating and then being able to track that over time and show our growth in that would be a really powerful story to share. And in one of your other graphs, it talks about we're a leader in the number of students participating in CTE programs. Let's let's show that off. Let's dive into the details um, because they are the best kept secrets within BCPS, some of these programs, and it'd be great to know I too want to know what's going on at Owings Mills and what, what these students are doing. And these are great stories to share. So I think having that data behind it and being able to show succinctly who's doing what where would be helpful. We'd love to share the good news that we're doing. <laughs> that sounds great. One thing I'll say is Owings Mills is one of our P-TECH schools. So when I okay. referenced before, so that's part of it. And Owings Mills is wonderful in a lot of ways, but that's right. one piece. Great. But yes, we can do that. All right. Well, thank you for everything about, oops, oops. Ms. Frampong. <laughs> Just snuck that hand up there. Go ahead. <laughs> so thank you for the presentation. Um, definitely some kudos I know of um, a parent who had her uh, child doing some of that dual enrollment in early college. We hear a lot about AP, um, but she went down the path of early college and dual enrollment, and so um, in just two years was able to finish with a bachelor's degree at Amazing. a really good school mm -hmm. um, and is now pursuing a master's. So again, kudos. Um, it's a, it's a wonderful program. Mm -hmm. And also, um, I'm excited about for our students who are not meeting CCR, um, the idea of working with the parents to understand what is it that the student is interested in. I mean, an engaged learner is basically going to be the best type Absolutely. of learner. So with the, the questions I have, um, the Power Inform system, that's our data management system. and. <coughs> We're using that to determine if a student is on track in grade nine. Is that correct? So that on track is for graduation? Yes. OK. But now we're going to start using it from the perspective of on track for CCR. Yes. Okay. So the um, correct. So Power Inform actually has multiple different um, widgets, they call it. <laughs> and so what we've referenced there is that the team has actually created a report for schools that also will help them identify who is not yet CCR within that same. So we still have the ninth grade tracker okay. about passing those core courses to stay on track for graduation. And we have the ability to report, as Dr. DiDonato said, using multiple data points to identify students at risk of not meeting that CCR standard. OK. So. Do we know at this point what percent of our students are on track to meet the CCR versus the students that are not on track to meet the CCR? I don't have that data in front of me. I also will say they're about to potentially change the standard <laughs> for what that means and that will impact our data, um, but certainly we could take that back. Okay, so we'll, I guess at a later time we'll be able to get that update for okay and then the next piece would be for these plans they are individualized support plans to help meet the standards but the standards which have not yet been determined I understand right. but once we know what those standards are the standards will be the same it's just how do we help the students individually meet those standards, but it is the same standard, correct? Yes, okay. so, and again, I wanna offer, um, we've been given very little guidance across the state mm -hmm. about how to implement this part. So LEAs are partnering together, we're, we're trying to, to do our best to meet the expectations. What Blueprint talks about is it uh, needs to be individualized, it needs to align to college and career ready standards right. in literacy and mathematics. So actually using the, the content standards of the framework mm -hmm. of the curriculum. And then it needs to be culturally responsive, which is where we built in the opportunity of agency and choice and students having that opportunity um, and then project or problem based okay. so based on that pretty um, you know basic criteria we have developed a series of about 12 to 15 different projects that are currently going through um, uh, review in CNI and with some partnership for schools um, and sharing with other LEAs to understand what they're doing so the target was using the content standards mm -hmm in the 9, 10, and 11, 12 band for both literacy and then algebra one, algebra two, or geometry, um, and develop these project plans. To Part of what MSDE and the AIB, which is the accountability board for Blueprint, have said is first things first, they have to determine the measure. Then they will talk about reassessment opportunities, how do you change the status. So they have sort of intentionally said that's on hold until they know the standard. And yet our obligation for these individual pathways is here now. Right. So what we're doing is using 
using the actual content standards to drive the project while offering choice on the topic. So some of the math projects, students get to research a topic of interest, thinking about how they can use mathematic skill, mathematical skills to solve a wide range of problems. Okay. Um, that's where we're leaning in and sharing with other LEAs. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation and answering our questions, but they're good questions and it's a good topic, so thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. The next item on the agenda is the report on the FY 2023 Annual Comprehensive Financial Report, and for that I call on, am I on the right one? Uh, we I've got all these financial reports, okay. Just making sure you're all awake, okay, basic. Right, the next item on the agenda is report on infrastructure update on the enterprise res resource planning ERP system. And for that I call on Mr. Augusto, Mr. Hartlove, and Mr. McCaw. And Miss and Dr. <laughs> the lady here is gonna get them started. <laughs> Dr. Rogers will get them started. Yes, good evening everyone and thank you for the opportunity to provide everyone with an update on our enterprise resource planning project uh, implementation update uh, regarding what you can expect. The next slide please. As everyone is aware, we identified four major priorities for Baltimore County P Public Schools, one of them being infrastructure. Specifically, our goal is to make sure that we're providing efficient, effective, responsive, and reliable systems to assure, ensure smooth operations across our school system. And so this project that you approved, and we are grateful for your approval and the transfer this evening uh, for the specific funds, will impact our day-to-day -day operations across all schools and across all offices. Uh, we really have Mr. Augusto working as the uh, lead because this is about high quality data and data integrity. Um, however, this project is so significantly important, you see three chiefs sitting in front of you as this work will impact our finances as well as our human resources. All three offices, divisions impact every single staff member across Team BCPS. And so without um, further delay, I turn it over to Mr. Augusto to walk us through uh, and members of the team. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rogers, uh, board members. So I'd like to start, next slide, please. Just to kind of define what is ERP, so Enterprise Resource Planning. And in, <clears throat> it's a platform that provides an integrated process of core business functions, meaning there are, in any organization, there are the key functions that keep the business running. So human resources, budget, financing, procurement, all of these functions inherently talk to each other. They're tightly woven. So for example, onboarding will result in somebody being in the payroll system getting paid. For finance, budgeting, you budget out every year. You go through the procurement process for, to procure goods and services, which will then feed into financial systems. So it makes sense to have a platform that efficiently manages and tightly integrates those processes. Uh, the other point I want to make, and Dr. Rogers did mention, that the ERP project is a business transformation effort. It's, it's not solely technology. It's really about how do we change the way we do business um, for the better, right? So next slide. Oh, before we go to the next slide, I actually want to mention, and that's a graphic there on the top, on the right there, shows the, the feed and the different areas that uh, tie to each other. So what I'd like to do is Mr. McCall can talk about the HR pieces, uh, specifically to BCPS and how this ERP will be affecting that. First of all, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I'm excited about this project, and of course, as was mentioned, we have the three of us here. We're working collaborat collaboratively across divisions to actually have this uh, platform implemented across the system. Um, one of the things, of course, where we are currently, we've uh, begun the um, work with the discovery sessions with AST. 
Of course, ASC is the company we're working with that will help us with implementing the uh, Oracle system. Uh, we provided all of our current uh, standard operating procedures uh, to them so that they know where we are currently with our processes. As we move forward, uh, AST will help us with providing those uh, um, modifications, if you will, to our standard operating procedures. And then with that, uh, we'll be able to, um, as Pedro had mentioned earlier, those processes will be uh, uh, working to uh, interact with each other. Uh, the other thing that, of course, that we're, where we are currently with our implementation is the, uh, one of the things we, we discuss with other school systems uh, who are implementing the Oracle um, uh, platform was that they noticed that there was a, um, a, a time commitment from their employees. And so one of the things that we're doing currently to help with offsetting the, uh, with the time commitment is to hire some of the backfields for individuals who are being 60, pulled from their jobs at 60% of their time during the, uh, during the uh, process of the implementation. As you know, uh, we're currently working with our platform of Frontline. And Frontline is our recruitment platform that we uh, recruit individuals to the school system, regardless of what bargaining unit, whether or not it's a paraeducator or a teacher, uh, administrator, uh, any other central office uh, um, uh, personnel, uh, to bring them into the system. Then once that person's applied to, through Frontline, they're then moved into onboarding, which is Silk Road, which is our currently uh, onboarding system. Uh, those systems are working, but the goal is obviously to bring Oracle in so that we have that one-stop shop, if you will, that will move from the recruitment platform into the onboarding. And then, of course, those systems talking with other systems across the system uh, with, when it comes to payroll and making sure people get paid as well. Okay. And uh, thank you, Mr. McCall. And uh, Mr. Hartlove, you can just speak a little bit about the finance pieces. Uh, sure. Uh, good evening again, uh, board. Um, the big thing with this system is, 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 is we've talked about our budget all the time, and we talk about the amount of dollars that go towards people. The system that we use is the leverage for, for the people. I mean, our, our folks, we need a better system, and the system that we went through a, law, a, a process to, to, uh, to procure this, this system is a good system. We've heard it. It's being used in systems our size across Maryland and across the country, so it's a, it's a very good system, um, and it will allow all of our employees, but specifically our employees in human resources and in the finance division, to be more efficient, because that's the big cost, is right now, because of uh, uh, systems that are not um, working the way we would like them to work, that really is an inefficiency for our staff. Um, this is an integrated system. Uh, we have a, a shared chart of accounts, shared positions, so positions within HR are also used on the budgeting side to bu budget for positions and also to uh, expense out um, um, uh, benefits and those types of things. So, um, and the chart of accounts again is, is utilized within the budget system, within the procurement system, within the uh, uh, financial uh, modules. So this will be a good system, great system. It will be a great thing for you know. I've been here for two years, and within the first few days, you know, we learned uh, from my folks that were like, "Wow, we would love to have a better system," and everybody's very excited to have this system. Uh, 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 up and running. We can't. We wish we could just sw flip a switch and have it have it up and running. We we know, uh, you know, during the implementation, it's hard work. It's because we have to do our jobs, our our everyday jobs, and at the same time, we have to implement the system. But uh, we know that uh, you know this current system we currently have. I think we implemented 20, 25 years ago. So we are setting up the future generation of BCPS employees. Hopefully, for hopefully they won't they won't be cursing us they'll be saying those folks did a great job a few years back putting in a really good system it's going to help us move forward sure. thank you Chris next slide please so that's a good segue into where are we so as uh, Chris had mentioned there's a lot of work um, Mr. McCall also mentioned uh, we kicked off this project officially in October of this year uh, we're currently going through discovery sessions. Uh, the reason for the discovery sessions is to understand 
the processes, the business processes currently being used by VCPS, those are being aligned against the best practices that are embedded into the Oracle um, cloud uh, solution. And as a little bit different than may have been done in, in the years past, uh, there's this concept of um, building to standard. So within the system, and this is the approach uh, that ERP vendors are doing now is, you have the best practice within the application. Instead of customizing and getting into uh, the bad habits of putting in non-standard processes, you have to justify why cannot the process that, or why can't you retrofit to the process that we're telling, <coughs> excuse me, we're telling you is best practice in the industry. So that's a little bit of a change, and that's what's going on right now. Uh, we will go. Um, implement HR, payroll, and as Chris mentioned, the charter accounts in early 2025. Strategically, we chose HR and payroll to address some of the issues um, that we've heard throughout the last couple years of um, efficiencies, lack of productivity within uh, the use of those systems. After the HR and payroll go live, we'll be following with uh, the financials and budget which will wrap up in, a, in April of 2026. So we are looking at a, a two year plus implementation, which is typical for ERP implementations. Uh, next slide, please. Now, we understand this is a very critical project. There's a sizable investment in this project. So um, I want to detail here some of the things that we're doing um, to prepare for a successful implementation. First and foremost, we've hired a dedicated project manager. This project manager has experience. He's a seasoned project manager that has experience with Oracle Cloud implementations and actually working with our integration vendor. So he understands the pitfalls, he understands the challenges, he understands what it takes uh, to get through the finish line. The second one is in a, <clears throat> as I mentioned, everyone here has mentioned, our integration vendor has already started the discovery sessions uh, to understand the business workflows. Uh, another important one is the governance. We have an ERP governance committee. All three of us here are part of our co-sponsors, uh, executive sponsors on that steering committee. That committee is put together. Um, we meet regularly to go through any items to address issues, escalation points, and set direction for where we want to go. So you have the highest level here of senior leadership involved and engaged in the implementation of the ERP project. Uh, next is the formal classroom training for uh, BCPS. We're identifying train the trainers, and that's gonna be our approach for making sure that the new features and functions and the workflows that are um, implemented are um, pushed out to all staff. Uh, we've mentioned it time and time again, this is not solely an IT project. So because of this, there's a huge organizational change management piece to this. So um, there is a formal organizational change management plan and strategy that will be put together. Uh, that's going to include communication. That's going to include strategies for adoption of the new business processes that we're implementing. Um, it's, it's a key uh, aspect to the success of an ERP implementation. And lastly, um, after every go live, we have dedicated 60-day support, post-implementation support. Vendor will be available, um, priority items for anything that comes up for those post-60 days, uh, just to ensure smooth transition and implementation. Next slide, please. Okay, and at that point, we'll be open to any questions you might have. Thank you for that. Um, Ms. Frempong. Thank you for the presentation. Um, it, it's a formidable project. Yes, so yes. having a background in engineering, I, I understand that. Um, my question is for the support. So it is going into different areas. It's not just technology that's being impacted. But let's say, for example, from Mr. McCall's group, um, HR is having some trouble 
post these 60 days? Is the IT department within BCPS at that point the primary um, support, or are we still relying on the vendor? No, so the dedicated, the post 60 day support is for surge support. Um, after the 60 days, the uh, vendor will be available, but there's a knowledge transfer to my IT staff as well to be able to support this ongoing. So that'll be part of our steady state operations. Other questions? Ms. Hen? Thank you. And thank you for the presentation. Yes. It's outstanding. I promise I won't ask too many questions, but this is my bailiwig. Um, Mr. Gusto, you mentioned organizational change management, yes. which was great to hear because I was going to ask about that and how I know how important it is. Can you tell me who's the owner of that, who developed the plan? Is there a similar task force that's been formed to <coughs> own the change management piece? Yeah, so the organizational change management is uh, it's a it's a joint responsibility between BCPS and the AST, or our integration vendor. Um, so part of the plan, which is being formulated now, um, will include who the stakeholders are. Um, we'll put together adoption strategies and part of the outreach for communication as to um, how do we, in essence, sell this um, to our staff? Mm -hmm. um, there's going to be a dedicated change manager for this. So as we did with the PM, right. there's going to be a dedicated CM for this. Thank you. And same question with regards to um, business process re-engineering. Can you speak to that about who's owning that from BCPS's perspective? Um, it's actually going to be uh, on the different divisions. Now, the vendor is owning working with um, our business units to go through workflows. And as I mentioned before, um, I want to be very clear that for business process reengineering, we are, um, it's the, the onus is going to be on the business unit to try and, and explain why we want to deviate from a standard practice that's built into the application. So, um, so there's, a, there's a process, it's going to be managed by the overall PM. But a lot of the work is going to be done between the vendor and um, the identified staff of the business units. Okay. Lastly, can you speak to risk management, both from a project implementation yep. standpoint and then beyond implementation? Sure. Are you working with the internal audit office at all, or will they be brought in in terms of <laughs> data validation or auditing? Yeah, so in terms of the project, um, our project manager, one of the deliverables um, for the project is a risk register. So it is documenting um, the risks, the given a total exposure score um, based on likelihood of the risk being realized and impact to the project. Um, we have not reached out to audit or any of the post um, implementation governance areas. Um, we've managed, because we manage any of the current ERP changes through our governance committee, which sets the direction and sets priority. But in terms of um, anything with managing risk, we'll work with the group as we've done with any of the systems that we have in place. Because this touches every part, every um, person associated with Team BCPS, I think internal audit has been charged with, or their charge is managing organizational risk. So I, th I think it would be helpful um, to include them in some of the planning, at least at a high level, so that they can advise on, on the organizational risk. Thank you, Ms. Hen, for your suggestion. Um, we also have a uh, working to round out our risk management team. That decision has, been made, has not been made yet, but we'll definitely take, take note of it. Thank you. Other, you've, other questions, Ms. Stileski? Um, thank you. Um, employees are really quite excited about this. Um, and this is not my area of expertise, but if people are curious, is there a simple explanation for the implementation why, you know, it is, sure. I don't want to say slow, but it um, does take several years to fully implement, just for people who are curious. Yes. Thank you. Um, and, and you mentioned, so this is a very expansive project. So <clears throat> it goes through, um, as you see, three divisions here, multiple offices. So this, the breadth of scope of this is huge. Um, we have to implement 
each of these separate areas, but also keep in mind that we want to integrate, because that's the whole reason we're doing this. We're trying to build these efficiencies, so we need to have the proper integrations. Um, in today's technology, it's a little bit easier with open APIs versus how this was done 20 years ago, but there's still a huge integration effort. There's still a huge data migration effort because you have to get all the HR, all the financial data, which is critical. We want to make sure it's right, pulled out of the legacy application, mapped into the new system that we're doing. So there's a lot of work that goes into making sure this thing gets done correctly. Thank you. Ms. Booker Dwyer. Yes, I'm excited about this system. Um, so I only have three questions for you. On your timeline slide, slide four, you go from October 2023 to early 2025. Um, so could you just talk a little bit about what's happening in 2024? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the, um, the HR payroll go live. So as I mentioned, we're going through discovery. Once discovery is completed, um, through this process, we're also doing, because we're front loading, as I mentioned, data migration, so the mapping, the data analysis is also going on as we're going through the discovery session. Once discovery is completed, then comes the large effort of doing the configuration of the system based on um, feedback that the vendors received from our business units. And then once that is complete, then we're doing the testing and then the rollout. And then also, because of these um, business units, there are times where we have to implement. So uh, for HR and payroll, um, if we don't hit a date, then it goes in quarterly incre increments. So that's, it's, there's a lot of moving pieces to juggle. But your typical implementation for HR payroll is around a 15, 18 month period. Um, overall, it's about a little shade over two years. Okay. And when would we be able to see a demonstration of the ERP system? Like as pizzas are being built out, will we be able to get like a high level overview or presentation of how it works? I think what we'll need to do is figure out the best way to show that, uh, simply because <clears throat> the way this works is, it is kind of the waterfall mentality for implementation, so you're getting the entire system. There'll be bits and pieces, but then you'll have the entire rollout go live. We'll run through, near the end of the first implementation, we'll run through two consecutive payroll runs and doing a um, comparison between the legacy and the new, making sure everything lines up, reconciles. Um, so we can work with the vendor to try and show some kind of demonstration. It may not be, it can be a hybrid, may not be all of our right. uh, data, but at least give you a feel for what to expect. Or even if it's focused, like I'm really interested on the budget formulation um, and how this system is gonna work to do that. So if we even had just a quick snapshot of, this is the data we input and this is what it spits back out to us and that's how it's informing our, uh, the, the creation of the budget, that would even be um, helpful. And then, I mean, it would also, I'm wondering if this data that you're collecting through HR, will it allow us to see the trend data um, around resignations and to, especially to begin to distill down to, you know, are there certain, are we see, seeing certain trends? Are there certain teachers that are resigning at a higher rate of, uh, than others? Are there certain teachers in certain schools that are resigning at a higher rate than others, especially like a year or less? So would it be able to spit that data out pretty quickly? There is, uh, th there is the ability to do that, and I'll tell you why. Because um, one of the things with the implementation, and again, this is part of changing how we're doing our business, is position management we're going to single incumbency so that every um, employee will have a unique ID and that will be tracked to a position. So because we'll have that information in that way, we'll be able to track by position or by role um, what's going on. And the other thing is, um, this platform allows for more self-service reporting. So we'll have the ability to go in and query the system, um, we being DOIT, uh, a little bit easier than with the legacy system. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Ms. Frampong? Okay, so you got me interested with the data yes. and trending. So will you be working then, for example, we have um, 
I'm going to screw up the name of our department, but the people who do our data. Draw. Thank you. So are you working with them then to kind of develop those use cases so that they can determine self-service reporting? Um, I think the, so the, the use cases, I think, will be built on as we start going through, because part of um, the implementation, the communication process is just to go through, well, what can people expect? What okay. features and functionality are mm -hmm. there? Um, I think what I would suggest here, we'll, we'll take this to, to heart, is that in reaching out to draw, we'll say, here's what you have um, at your fingertips. Start thinking about what information you would like to compile and be able to report on. Right, perfect. Okay, thank you. Okay, if we can, I know this is very exciting. It is very new. We, too, are very excited about changing how we do business as a school system. Uh, this evening, we really wanted to provide an overview of what the project is going to look like, what the aims of the project are like, and we promise we'll be back with updates as we get deeper into it. Uh, but it looks like we're going to go into it. What about this, and what if this? And I don't want the uh, gentleman in an attempt to uh, respond and be responsive, you know, uh, make a statement that may or may not be where we land as we get further into the project. And so really wanted to uh, thank everyone uh, for sharing an overview. Really want to thank everyone for your investment and your enthusiasm and excitement um, because we are too, because it will impact everyone who's here as well as everyone that we want to bring to be a part of Team BCPS. Okay, so thank you for all of that information, and we look forward to hearing more and more about it as time goes on. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is an information items, including the financial report for the month ending September 2023, minutes of the September Southeast Area Education Advisory Council meeting, and the new superintendent's rule for 0500 workplace bullying. Um, wait a second. Let me just scroll through. The next item on the agenda is board committee updates and any agenda citing, setting items. Um, the first committee update is Mr. McMillian for the audit committee. Uh, we will not meet in December. Our next meeting will be January, <coughs> Tuesday, January 16th at 4.30. So please join us. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Domenowski, budget committee. Uh, we canceled our meeting on Wednesday with, uh, this past Wednesday, with um, a lot of budget talks coming up, working on next fiscal year budget. We wanted to give our staff uh, a rest until we have all of our questions <laughs> ready for those, for that budget. Thank you for doing that. Um, buildings and contracts, Ms. Harvey is not here. Mr. Young, would you like to say anything? The next building and contracts meeting is Monday, December 4th at 4.30. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, curriculum, we, our next meeting is actually um, a week from today, and we have um, several contracts to go over. Um, Dr. Savoy for equity. Our next, our next meeting will be held in January, the first week in January on a Thursday at 4 o'clock for okay. equity. And Ms. Booker Dwyer, I think we're getting ready to start your committee. Oh, we're getting ready to kick off in a big way. <laughs> so everyone should tune in for that at 4.30 on November 30th. Um, this will be a level setting meeting where we're going to go over just the purpose of the um, Legislative and Governmental Relations Committee. We'll go over some of the MAIB, the Maryland Association of Boards of Education, some of their legislative priorities. Um, but yeah, we're ready to, to, to rock and roll this um, legislative session. So. Um, Tune in. Right, Mr. Baysmore, better get ready back there, okay? Get ready. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just have one more thing with the agenda items oh. as we think. Um, Go ahead. That, you know, for, for future agenda. Is, that, is this the time where we still Go don't Go for it. Okay. <laughs> um, the, the, the section on information for the, on the board meeting uh -huh. um, agenda, the financial reports, I think they should be included in our monthly discussions. Um, not just the information item in case a board member has questions about that monthly report. Like I have questions about this monthly report to the board um, and I just, I'm not sure what's the appropriate venue to do that if we don't right. open it up for discussion. I get this is this point it would be our weekly, I mean your bi-weekly report, um, but we can take that into okay. advisement. Yep. Thank you. Um, and Ms. Pumphrey for policy review committee. Our next meeting is December 11th at 430. 
Okay, thank you. And then any other agenda, agenda items from board members? Ms. Hen? Thank you. I would like to see space on the agenda um, to allow Dr. Rogers to respond to the public after they comment, um, if she would care to um, respond. Um, often our stakeholders do not receive a formal response from the system, and this would be an opportunity for them to hear from her directly um, in a timely fashion. They take the time to come and speak to us. They deserve um, at least that type of response, if appropriate at the time, otherwise a follow-up um, written ex response. But I'd like to see a few minutes allotted on every agenda for a response following public comment. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Minowski? Uh, I, I have three, but they're ones I've already said. I just kind of want to get an update on these. Um, a capacity relief boundary study agenda item where it would include a presentation from strategic planning with recommendations on how we can improve this process and its frequency. I'd also um, like an agenda item for student behaviors uh, to include a plan to form a committee of educators, administrators, and central office tasked with creating recommendations to, to improve these student behaviors. and, and Cell phones, again, we haven't, uh, I'd like to see um, a, a presentation or update on the steps being taken to strengthen our cell phone policy and how we are advising, supporting our um, educators in its implementation. And um, happy Thanksgiving or have a wonderful holiday season. Thank you. Is that an agenda Great. item too? <laughs> no, I just was saying goodnight. Sorry. No, that's a good one. We'll do, we're, we're good with that. Right. We're good with that one. Any other agenda items, um, Ms. Stileski? Um, and just a special thank you. The CTE program is exceptional here. So um, just really exciting information to share. Thank you for that. And very exciting that the ERP implementation is happening as well. Um, what a great start to the year. I know that the teacher resignations are rising and um, you know, just an understanding of, of what's going on with teacher satisfaction, the reasons for the rise in the, in the resignations and what more we can do to support teachers and staff. Thank you and happy Thanksgiving. Are you saying as an agenda item the last part? Okay. Um, okay. Okay. So um, what we did that, let's see. The last item on the agenda is announcements. Um, the board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, December 5th, 2023 at 630. I hope everyone has a wonderful um, Thanksgiving and um, Thank we are you. thankful as a board for the staff and all of the information that you provide to us and the questions or actually the answers. We do, good, we do good with the questions, but you guys are doing great with the answers. So thank you um, for that and everybody have a wonderful evening. And we're adjourned. Me too.